can start. Uh, so I'm saying um, now good morning. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good earlier morning for those of you joining from, uh, from much farther or good very evening to those of you joining from even far, farther, farther. Um, welcome on behalf of uh, the European Association of the European Cancer Leagues uh, as a secretariat to uh, the interest group MEPs Against Cancer on behalf of the Smoke Free Partnership uh, and on behalf of the MEP Lung Health Group and the MEP Heart Group uh, who have supported us in organizing, organizing this policy dialogue. Um, my name is Anka Toma. I'm the director of the Smoke Free Partnership and I will be your moderator today. Um, we are delighted to see uh, so many uh, participants joining us uh, slowly into, into this policy dialogue on Europe's path to the Tobacco Products di product Directive 3.0. Um, it's very exciting uh, to be already talking about the Tobacco Directive 3, um, or uh, as you will hear it referred to TPD, uh, we'll talk about a lot about the TPD 2, uh, and it's, uh, it's quite something to be talking about TPD 3 already. Uh, the objective of this meeting is uh, to, to discuss the progress achieved so far in the tobacco products uh, regulation and the tobacco products directive. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, the European Commission published an implementation report on that directive. And uh, uh, today we have um, a panel of, uh, of speakers who will discuss the findings of that report and who will um, discuss what worked, uh, what worked less well, and uh, what needs to be done moving forward in order to achieve uh, the European Union's ambition to become tobacco free by 2040. That ambition was stated earlier this year in the, Euro the European uh, Beating Cancer Plan. Um, and uh, achieving it, of course, will be a major step in, uh, in the fight against cancer, but also in the fight against uh, other non-communicable diseases, lung diseases, cardiovascular diseases, uh, and, and many, many others. Um, we are delighted to welcome today um, a wonderful lineup of speakers. Uh, and first, it is my pleasure and my honor to give the floor to, um, oh, I'm not giving the floor to anyone. First, to review the housekeeping rules, I do apologize. So this is a view on the event. Uh, attendees will not be able to uh, activate their uh, microphones. Um, we are being recorded and the recording will be made available on YouTube. Uh, we propose a few hashtags uh, for those of you who are uh, willing and uh, able to um, to tweet about, uh, about the event, hashtag TPD for public health. Um, we also want to flag that uh, the chat is for technical issues and the Q&A function, which is available at uh, the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, is where we will collect questions to ask the panelists and uh, speakers today. Um, if you need any assistance, uh, our colleagues from ECL who uh, have done a brilliant job in, in organizing this, uh, this webinar, um, they will be uh, available to, to help you. And with that, it is now my honor and pleasure to welcome uh, Mr. Lucas Furlas, MEP, who is the chair of the MEPs Against a Cancer Interest Group and our main host today for a special address. Mr. Furlas. Anna, thank you very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, as both the co-chair of MEPs Against Cancer Interest Group and a member of a special committee on beating cancer at the European Parliament, I'm very pleased to be addressing you today. Tobacco use is the leading cause of preventable cancer in the EU now. I am convinced that we can do a lot to change the situation and eliminate the use of tobacco. We may even be able to avoid as much as 90% of all lung cancer. The pandemic underlined that smokers have 
up to 50% higher risk of developing severe disease and death from the virus, a fact that shocked millions of them to want to quit tobacco. However, quitting can be difficult. I was a smoker for many years and annoyed at first hand. It is true that we have made significant steps in tobacco control in recent years, including the menthol ban of cigarettes and of course the launch of the European tobacco traceability system. However, the number of smokers in the EU is still high and the most worrying thing is the big number of young European smokers. We are now in the post-Europe's beating cancer plan launch with many areas to be implemented and developed. There are many great elements in the cancer plan. Among other things, it recognizes that there is still more work to do to reduce the exposure to smoke and achieve a tobacco-free Europe. The objective is very clear, to create a smoke-free generation in Europe where less than 5% of people use tobacco in the next 20 years by 2040. Today, 25% of the population are smokers. We need to step up our game and ensure that EU tobacco legislation is enforced more strictly. Today's event aims to develop a dialogue on concrete recommendations to improve the Tobacco Products Directive. Stopping smoking is a win-win situation of all ages always. Today, we join forces. We need to take into account the great work already being done by the European Parliament and civil society organization and build on that. From my side, I would like to assure you my actions will correspond with my words. Before I give the floor back to Anna, I would like to thank you for the invitation and express my congratulations on your excellent organization. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you very much for the for your intervention and and for your and for your commitment that was so clearly and loudly expressed. So well, not loudly physically, but loudly and in, in, in clarity. Thank you very much. Um, uh, well, we have um, a number of uh, presentations coming up in this uh, in this session, and. Um, uh, I will introduce our speakers of today. First, uh, Ms. Da Emerling, uh, who is uh, the head of unit for cross-border healthcare and tobacco control and the director general for health of the European Commission. Uh, and she has been steering the implementation of uh, the Tobacco Products Directive for the past few years. Uh, she will introduce the findings of the, of the application report recently published. Um, the next uh, speaker uh, will be Linda McCavan, who is a former MEP and uh, currently uh, an executive director for external relations for the European Climate Foundation. And then um, Dr. Esteve Fernandez Munoz, uh, who is the director of the Tobacco Control Unit of the Catalan Institute of Oncology in, uh, in Barcelona. Um, I will reintroduce them as they uh, as they come in speaking, but for now, they are over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Anka. You have already introduced me, so I can skip that part uh, and start directly with the key findings of the application report on the Tobacco Products Directive. Before I do that, um, one word to the Cancer Action Plan um, on which uh, MEP Fulas has already elaborated. Tobacco prevention, tobacco use has a very prominent part in that EU Cancer Action Plan with the objective of a tobacco-free generation by 2040. It's defined that by then less than 5% of the population uses tobacco compared to 25% today. And uh, we have also defined an interim goal because um, this is to reach the WHO target of a 30% relative reduction in tobacco use by 2025. 
as compared to 2010, which would correspond to a smoking prevalence of around 20% in the EU. You see that um, between now with the 25% of today and uh, 20% in 2025, this is already ambitious and uh, we cannot lose, loosen our efforts. So in order to reach the 2040 target, as well as the 30% target of the WHO, we really need um, to step up our efforts. Now, the Cancer Action Plan has outlined several pieces of legislation that the Commission is going to review, like the Tobacco Taxation Directive, um, the cross-border purchases of tobacco by private individuals. Uh, we want to tackle the Council recommendation on smoke-free environments. We will look at the Tobacco Products Directive and review it. And um, we also want to support member states in the full implementation of the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Um, the Cancer Action Plan also outlines enforcement activities um, on the existing legislation, and it talks about uh, tackling advertising in uh, social media and on the internet. Next slide, please. So um, now I, I would like to outline uh, along these five building blocks of the TPD, what we have found in uh, the first application report. And uh, it's structured around the warning labels, the track and trace system, the characterizing flavors, the ingredients, and the regulation of electronic cigarettes. Not completely in that order, but mainly. Next slide, please. Um, the Tobacco Products Directive is applicable since 2016, and we were supposed to come with, after five years, with an application report, and the directive itself specifies what is to be in it. And uh, we should look, for example, at market developments of special product categories. We were supposed to look at e-cigarettes and refill containers and also on the feasibility and benefits of a possible uh, European system for the regulation of ingredients and a union database. So what, what have we achieved so far? Uh, next slide, please. Ah, yeah. Um, so the, the report that came out in May this year is underpinned by a wealth of evidence we had a study on consumer preferences and perception of specific categories of tobacco and related product, a big support study on the application. We had a scientific opinion on electronic cigarettes. We have a new uh, updated Eurobarometer survey, and we have most of the results of a joint action on tobacco control that uh, mainly looked at uh, ingredients and uh, um, and, and uh, technical issues of product regulation. So this is all available on the internet and it underpins the Commission's application report. Next slide, please. So what did we find? We found that all member states have transposed the TPD. We are currently doing compliance checks with the member states and they are advancing. Um, the, uh, the harmonized application varies, that's what we can say. The enforcement level varies among member states, many lack adequate resources uh, for enforcement. The several member states have gone over the requirements of the directive. For example, nine member states have notified plain packaging provisions. So we see there is ambition to go further than the EU level. Um, the, at the EU level, we were struggling a lot um, with uh, cases at the European Court of Justice, but uh, it was upheld. So there were several challenges to the directive um, and uh, the directive was upheld. Now, one of the conclusions that we draw from uh, looking at uh, this picture was that we need to streamline the legislative framework. Uh, it's quite complicated. Um, we are also seeing that some of the definitions 
haven't kept pace with the market developments and need to be adapted. We say that we would like to explore EU level audits um, on, on how member states implement this directive. Uh, such audits exist in the food area and they also exist um, with um, pharmaceuticals and medical devices, but not with tobacco control. So we just have quite a limited picture and not an accurate picture over member states implementation and enforcement due to that uh, lacking capacity. Next slide, please. Now, if we go through the different building blocks of the directive, a big one is the labeling and the packaging. That was a key success. The bigger warnings and the pictorial health warnings were a key success of the TPD. And we see that overall labeling and packages, packaging rules are applied properly across the EU. We would like to explore the extent to which stronger labeling rules would work because we see that some member states go over and above what the directive provides um, and here the keyword is plain packaging that we want um, to look at next slide please yeah this is the plain packaging i've already said um, nine member states have introduced that plain and plain packaging with larger health warnings should be further examined next one then we see on cross-border distance sales, I didn't put this in, in the overview table because it's um, uh, we, before the application report and before the support study, we had very little evidence with what is happening there. What we saw is um, that uh, the age verification systems were not very successful. Um, we also saw that there's insufficient monitoring and enforcement of uh, the cross-border sales, distance sales restrictions, and member states have difficulties in controlling them. We also saw that already more than half of the member states have banned cross-border distance sales. So there is scope to develop this regime further or even go to a ban on cross-border distance sales. These are things that need to be explored in the months to come. But we see there is a problem and member states have gone over what they could do. A number, a good number of member states have gone over. Next slide, please. Then we come in three slides to a very complex piece um, that is the product regulation, priority additives, flavor bans. Here we see so it, it is very complex. Um, some of the provisions we see compliance. On others, we got very little actionable information. Overall, the system is very complex. The efficiency can be improved. And uh, we should think of organizing the whole process in a more robust and effective way. The application report suggests to consider harmonized EU level assessment of ingredients and products. Next slide. Another issue uh, is the characterizing flavors. Uh, in the beginning, so we have a ban on characterizing flavors with conditional exemptions for products other than cigarettes and roll your own. We had a four year period for mental to become effective. It only became effective on the 20th of May last year. And uh, we see that we have issues of compliance here, circumvention uh, through other product categories uh, or through paraphernalia, or they are still on the market in some member states. We have set up in order to determine whether a product still has a characterizing flavor, we have set up a whole system it's a very resource intense system. We've set up an independent advisory panel and a technical group. The technical group are the noses who sniff whether a product uh, has a characterizing flavor or not. And then the independent advisory panel gives an opinion. And based on this, we have a whole procedure that member states can follow if they want, if they detect the product with characterizing flavor and if uh, it is supposed to be banned, but it's 
a complex and long procedure. Next slide, please. And the third element under the ingredients is um, the reporting database. It's called the EU Common Entry Gate. This is where all the ingredients and emission information is stored. The Commission um, has set up a secure database and um, importers and manufacturers have to give that information. We have a wealth of valuable data and information there. There are some problems related to it. Um, for example, um, we have member states ownership of this data. So uh, it's very difficult to do uh, European level analysis. We also see that, um, that the, the industry, um, it, they use the confidentiality tech. They misuse it um, because some of them say everything is confidential so that member states cannot really deliver on uh, their duty to publish data on ingredients and emissions and they come into a difficult area of confidentiality. So um, this is not optimal. It's very costly and resource intense. Um, we think there is scope for improvement and uh, the practical experience suggests with this system suggests that a single EU database would be more efficient. Next slide, please. Um, now we skip that slide. We go next one, yeah. Then we have provisions on, uh, on novel tobacco products and on e-cigarettes. On the novel tobacco products, just two words to it. Um, this this uh, was thought as a capture all part of the tobacco products directive for everything that's new on the market. And it says that uh, everything that's new on the market, a member state has to, uh, to categorize it e either as a smokeless or as a tobacco product for smoking. Now we have categories like heated tobacco products um, that are categorized differently, which uh, might even merit um, an own cat to be an own category. Um, at least that's something um, that should be explored. So this is not an optimal, um, an optimal setting that we have here. We've also, uh, please click again. We've also seen um, that for novel tobacco products, the device is not covered. So one should look at uh, covering um, the tobacco product plus the device as we've done it with the e-cigarettes. Next slide. Um, we are also seeing uh, products on the market um, that are not covered at all and uh, emerging products like nicotine pouches, that's uh, an example, is the one that you see in the middle, that is um, currently not covered by uh, the tobacco uh, legislation because the only nicotine product we are covering are electronic cigarettes. So we have some loopholes and legal voids uh, that we want to address and where we have to do some common thinking how to best address them. Next slide. Next one, yeah. On the electronic cigarettes. Um, so here we are basing ourselves on an updated scientific opinion. And this scientific opinion has underlined that electronic cigarettes have con health consequences and it underlines also the important role that they play in smoking initiation. There's also good weight of evidence that flavor strongly influence young people. And we have seen several member states um, that started to ban flavors because here they can do this on, uh, on their own. So they can go over the TPD. Yeah, the report itself suggests that we should explore whether some provisions could be further developed. Uh, just, uh, just like uh, tank size, labeling, the use of flavors, nicotine-free liquids, also the advertising provisions, because we see a lot of um, um, a lot of advertising on social media and the internet. And insofar as e-cigarettes are presented as, smoke, as smoke, smoking cessation aids, so their regulation should follow the pharmaceutical legislation. Next slide. Um, next slide. 
we skipped we skip that, I said this already. Um, herbal products for smoking, um, there uh, we have a lot of problems um, with also with new products that enter the market, especially when they contain CBD, like cannabis. Um, next, please click again. Please click again. And uh, cannabis extracts are also a problem uh, in the e-cigarettes. And we need to look at that. As regards the track and trace system, what we can say, we have set it up. It's fully functional. It is working. We have problems with data quality still, and we are working through this. And we should examine and we will examine whether its performance can be improved by stronger audits. So uh, here we are proposing, proposing to really look at audits uh, on their scope, on their impact and safeguards so that they are really impartial and that there is public trust in these audits. So uh, we want to strengthen this audit function. Uh, next slide, and I come to the conclusions. So we've seen that the TPD has enhanced tobacco control. Its validity was upheld in court. In the five years of the application, we have achieved the 2% reduction target that the impact assessment had spelled out. It's not percentage point, it's percentage. So it's, it was not totally ambitious. The TPD has contributed to the improvement of public health and it has provided value added and members that member states could not have accomplished uh, in the objectives alone. And you can see in the support study that many of them really appreciated um, the, the cooperation at the European level that uh, they had through the expert group. Overall, it was considered to be consistent internally but we have market developments and I have uh, pointed out some of them like nicotine pouches um, and, uh, and uh, missing definitions or definitions that need to be improved so that there is scope for improvement in certain essential areas. Next slide. I just wanted to give some figures. Um, the MEP Furlas has already given figures, but uh, these are the updated figures for the EU 27. We have a smoking prevalence of 25%. You see a very mixed picture with uh, some high smoking prevalence still in, either, in Eastern and Southern member states and um, relatively low rates and shrinking rates um, in, in uh, more Northern countries. So very mixed pictures on which um, we are on which we work. Um, the UK has left the EU. With the UK, this uh, the smoking prevalence uh, would be at 23 percent, and not at 25, because uh, it has the UK had, has a, quite a strong tobacco control policy. Now, just a very last slide to look at um, is what we see with young people, because the TPD uh, aimed at young people. And what this is now here with the UK, you can see that the smoking prevalence um, went down between 2017, the last Eurobarometer, and 2020. This, uh, the, the, the most recent Eurobarometer, it went down. Um, for the for young people from 29 to 20 percent, but uh, the use of new products, e-cigarettes and HTPs, that has nearly tripled among young people, and the market share is really small. But um, this is a worrying trend because we really see the increase, um, especially for young people. Now, um, so we've seen the TPD had an effect, but more needs to be done. The ambition of the cancer action plan is very high and the commission will start with the most to change the most, to use the most effective tobacco control tool, which is the tobacco taxation, which is tobacco taxation. And the first proposal that will come is the, uh, the change in the tobacco taxation directive. And with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Thea, for your um, for your comprehensive um, introduction to the to the report. Uh, we've already started receiving questions in the Q and A. Uh, we will address them. Um, I remind the participants, please, to introduce yourself when you ask questions, so that uh, everyone uh, knows who you are. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce Linda McAvan, um, who was able to join us. Thank you very much, Linda, for joining us today. Um, Linda McAvan was the rapporteur on the current tobacco products directive, and uh, we've asked her to um, to uh, give an overview of what happened and what the lessons learned were um, for her as an as a politician, as an MEP. Um, who was committed and who is committed to tobacco control. So Linda, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank, thank, thank you, Anka, and good morning, everybody. And sorry just to join you to join you now. I caught the tail end of what um, Thea Emmeling from the European Commission was saying. Um, and I'll come back to that in a few moments. Just to say, I, uh, I was an MEP until... I, I um, stood down from Parliament before the 2019 elections, but of course, I'm British, as you can probably hear. So even if I stood in 2019, wouldn't be one of the MEPs anymore. Um, but I was an MEP for 21 years. And I think the first thing I was thinking when I was asking, uh, Anka asked me to talk about what did I learn? And I learned that tobacco control legislation is very difficult. It's very difficult because it's a subject of intensive lobbying and um, quite a lot of public debate. And in particular, in the last reform in 20, it was 2013, when we were working on this 20, it was throughout 2013, 2012, 2013, there was a very huge public debate about e-cigarettes. It was quite an aggressive um, debate about e-cigarettes. It's interesting for me to hear the commissions, what's happened since. But um, I just want, I don't want to speak for too long because I know you have a full program. Um, I think one of the first lessons I learned was to the debate, you know, the it's going to be a lot of lobbying. And I'll talk about that in a moment from from tobacco companies, from e-cigarette companies. But one of the lessons learned was to keep coming back to why we were doing this in the first place. And I saw that the European Commission uh, just reminded us that the aim of the Tobacco Products Directive review last time was to reduce the number of young smokers, to stop children smoking. And um, because we know that the majority of people who start smoking are recruited before their 18th birthday. And what we learned was that the tobacco industry will talk an awful lot about how their marketing is only about brand marketing to existing smokers, how they have a responsible attitude, but in reality, what is really going was really going on in the run-up to the 2013 reform was that the tobacco industry was about to launch onto the market a whole series of new products designed to um, attract young people into smoking. And um, because they were losing ground, I mean, they were losing smokers. And so um, one of the aims of the, the previous reform was to stop gimmick products coming onto the market. And um, I don't have them anymore. And maybe at some point, um, the Smoke Free Partnership or the Cancer, Cancer uh, League Against Cancer, they, they can show you some of the products, but what they were aiming to launch was lipstick packages and perfume packs marketed particularly at young women, flick out packs aimed at teenage boys, a lot of emphasis on they were on flavorings, and I just interesting to hear that the e-cigarettes are doing well amongst flavorings amongst young people, because that was where they were trying to take cigarettes, and there was even some samples of chocolate cigarettes being launched, um, and it was the civil society and the cancer research organisations who came to me very strongly before I was appointed rapporteur, showing me these products and saying. The, these are things we, we cannot allow onto the market. And I'm pleased to say that the result of the reform in 2014, when it was ratified, was to get standardized packaging. And I can picture the European commissioner at the time, the health commissioner saying that cigarettes should look like cigarettes, be packaged like cigarettes and taste like cigarettes. And we um, successfully 
standardized packaging, got the uh, got the um, health warnings bigger, and gave member states crucially the right if they wanted to go forward to plain packaging. And I think it would be very interesting in the reform to see whether countries with how how the packaging has has worked and whether countries with um, plain packaging have lower smoking rates than those without. I don't know what's happened. Um, and I think what was important about sticking the focus on why we're doing it was because you can get, you know, a legislation as long, you get bogged down in the detail, and you can forget the basic principles. But when we talk to the public, even smokers wanted to stop gateway products for young people. You know, people do not did not want to see a new generation recruited. And, and I think it's interesting to see that the, just hear from the commission that the numbers of young smokers has gone down. That part of the legislation has worked. I said there was a lot, there'll be a lot of lobbying. Um, yes, and it's a different kind of lobbying from the kind of lobbying. I've done lots of legislation on, on difficult legislation, on, clim on climate legislation, on emissions trading schemes, on pharmaceutical legislation. But what was different about tobacco lobby was that they use a lot of unbranded lobbying um they lobby below below the radar um they circulate amendments to MEPs but they don't do it like most organizations by saying oh these are this is what our industry wants to achieve and this is why we're suggesting these things they sent blank they, they circulated blank amendments around colleagues and they and they found um colleagues to table them um they use they, they, lots of organizations started to appear, like the small shopkeepers who were against the revision of the directive. Um, and they were contacting M members of parliament in their own constituencies, saying they were grassroots and concerned about their sales if, um, if um, the packaging laws were changed. But behind those small shopkeepers were, were tobacco companies. And I know that because they rang my office insisting to see me, but we found out that it was just a tobacco company behind it. Um, there'd be local smokes, you know, grassroots smokes associations were set up, but each time if you do, I mean, some, I don't know whether, you know, look, look at the organizations and try and find out who funds them, follow the money and find out who's funding them. Their, the favorite tactic of the tobacco industry was to talk a lot about the nanny state, how the tobacco law were, you know, that smokers are adults, they make their own choices. Um, and that they, as tobacco companies, are responsible and can help with harm reduction um, um, campaigns. But in reality, as I said, their main aim was to stop the standardization of packaging because they wanted to launch their new products. And they employed lots of people to work for them. They employed former MEP colleagues to access MEPs. They employed um, trade unionists to talk to MEPs. Um, I was a member of the socialist group and they thought that would be a powerful tool. Um, they employed lots of different types of people to, to approach. And, um, and we did get a real insight into what they were trying to do because Philip Morris's strategy was leaked to the, um, to the civil society and became public. And what we saw there was quite insight in, in, insightful because it showed that they had one company, and I forget the figures, and I'm sure Anka Tom, I can tell you that they had employed something like I think it was 160 something um, lobbyists, one company, and they had they had categorized MEPs by whether the, by traffic light system of whether they were receptive, red, green, and amber, if I remember. Um, so that will be the lobbying strategies of of of, of companies, um, unless they've given up on the European market, um, and that's another question. Um, as MEPs, we try to remind that the European Union is a is a signature of the framework Convention on Tobacco Controls. That applies to the European Union, it applies to the European Parliament. And what does that mean? And again, I would check the rules. It means that um, policymakers should minimize their contact with a tobacco company and any meetings they have with them should be transparent and in the public domain. So, um, and there were other tactics used like swamping the consultation, the tobacco industry swamped the consultation before the legislation was launched. Um, so that it took it took legislation. We got late into the into the legislative cycle, and I think there was an attempt to delay the launch of the legislation so long that it would not get finished before the end of that mandate. And there was a concerted push to use procedures and to they they were even phoning our voting office night before votes to you know to to question procedures um, to try and slow down the voting. E-cigarettes. Um, Nobody, nobody thought at the outset of the, of the revision that the e-cigarette issue would become such a big one. 
and um, it became very contentious um, and was a very aggressive lobby actually it's one it was one where a lot of MEPs me included got threats you know it was a, a very difficult um, lobbying campaign um, at the time they were new products we knew very little about them and there was very little regulation so um, the some of the lobby some of the campaigning was suggesting that you know we wanted to ban these cigarettes but the reality was it was all about how to regulate them and um, make sure that the products were safe on the market and also although there was a suggestion by the companies that the products the e-cigarettes were going to be marketed only as quick products that they were for that the products were for smokers um, designed to reduce harm among smokers there was always you know, we didn't know whether that would lead to a gateway for young people to start smoking or whether it was going to be, e-cigarettes would be a dual use um, product, allowing smokers to smoke longer because they could get nicotine when in places where they can't smoke. And it's interesting for me to see what the European Commission is saying now and the evidence. And I think I would look at the evidence about e-cigarettes um, because the whole idea was that they should not be gateways for, as leisure products to young people to make them into nicotine addicts. They were, they were, you know, they were an, an aid to tobacco harm reduction. Um, now, other lesson, the importance of civil society. We got, um, I mentioned how big the tobacco lobby is. Um, the, the, they have a lot of resources. CSO, civil society organizations do not have a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of resources, but they were crucial in helping us get the evidence about um, health impacts, the evidence of, 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 of what was going on. Academic work was also very important. Um, academic networks like the Tobacco Tactics Network, giving us insights into how companies organize and, and, and what the tactics are of those companies. So I think those kind of organizations would be useful for a legislator. And um, the final point I wanted to make was, um, I. Obviously, the size of the tobacco market inside Europe is shrinking, though. I just saw those figures quite, you know, to see that in some southern European countries, these European countries still have 40% of the population smoking, it's still very high, but the prevalence is going down. And we've seen the tobacco companies switch their attention into new markets. In the last parliament, I was the chair of the International Development Committee, and we did look at one point um, at um, tobacco tactics in in Africa, for example, where there is an attempt to market more products. I don't know um, the scope of the, any new revisions, but there's a lot of talk at EU level about responsible business practices, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it might be interesting to look at how companies, even if we regulate inside the European Union, what some of those companies are taking as um, tactics when they go into other geographies. So maybe I'll stop there. Um, um, and I'm afraid I'm not able to stay for your Q&A session. But if, um, yeah, and yeah, I've just seen now I've got a message saying 106, Philip Morris employed 160 people across all the EU member states. It's one, one for every four MEPs, basically. That's the level of the lobbying. So um, I'm, I'm, I don't know whether, uh, but I, I'm not able to say long, but if there was any burning issue or you wanted to remind me of something I I've forgotten because it is seven years ago, I realized, um, and I'm not working on every day anymore. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. I think you expressed uh, quite well the atmosphere during that, uh, that, um, that review. Um, I think, uh, well, I think we were quite lucky to have you on the side of public health and uh, and your environment committee at the time. And uh, and just a big thank you for joining us today. Yeah, I suppose I should have said that actually the good news was that I said all the tactics, but actually we got good legislation in the end and the, and the MEPs across the political parties mainly gave a lot of support for public health. And, and indeed, there was quite a lot of leadership across across the political groups, um, and and uh, there was that uniting um, objective to to prevent kids from taking up smoking. 
Um, on, uh, on that thankful note, I am going to pass the, uh, the microphone to Esteve Fernandez, to Professor Esteve Fernandez, who is the director of the Tobacco Control Unit at the Catalan Institute of Oncology in Barcelona. Uh, Esteve has been uh, doing quite a lot of work in measuring uh, various EU legislations, uh, but also national provisions. And uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, some of the key findings that are relevant to the TPD. Esteve, over to you. Thank you very much, Anka. I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. Oops. OK. Oops. Something. I believe. Oh, wait. If you if you need sure. any assistance, I'm I'm okay now. Okay now. I hope I have to leave the meeting. So no no. <laughs> yeah, can you share my slides? Because my computer doesn't has doesn't have the rights. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. I did uh, a few amendments, a last minute amendments, but uh, doesn't matter. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much again for the kind invitation to contribute to this uh, very interesting dialogue in the form of a webinar. Uh, as uh, Anka said, I will try to provide some data from different European projects in which I have been uh, working uh, in order to just provide data to drive uh, public health and tobacco control decisions to make evidence-based tobacco control and public health interventions and actions. So, um, well, these are my competing interests in case you are interested, they are public, but going to the, to the point. My, the outline of my presentation, uh, well, this, the, the projects I, I'm going to, to show you have uh, produced more than 40, 45 uh, scientific articles in peer review journals. So my intention was to provide some very specific information that can contribute, understand what has happened with uh, TPD2 and uh, possibly to drive uh, some aspects of TPD3 as we, we show. So we will uh, revise poly use of tobacco products, also the use specifically of uh, electronic cigarettes and heated tobacco products. We also, I am also going to, I'm also going to show some data on exposure to secondhand aerosols from electronic cigarettes, although TPD uh, does not legislate uh, on secondhand smoke exposure, nor secondhand aerosol exposure, but I believe uh, can be of relevance. We will uh, have a look at trajectories of smokers, something uh, about menthol that has been already mentioned, and of course, warning labels and support, in this case, of smokers to tobacco control. Ah, next slide, okay. Thank you. I'm using uh, data from these three European funded projects. The URES Plus, coordinated from the European Network for Smoking Prevention, the TAX uh, project, coordinated from my own unit here at the Catalan Institute of Oncology, and the uh, Joint Action on Tobacco Control, coordinated from the Hellenic uh, Cancer Society. In next slide, I wanted just, well, you have uh, already seen this slide uh, shown by by there. It's the overall prevalence and, and the, the country prevalence of uh, smoking. But I wanted to notice you that this is the prevalence of four different tobacco products combined. Current use of cigarettes, the most popular, cigars, cigarillos, and pipes, with a wide range of variation from 7% in Sweden to more than 40% uh, in Greece and an average in the European Union about uh, 20, 23, 24, as far as I remember, 23%. So in next slide, what I want to show is the 
relevance of the types of tobacco. We have seen that the current use of tobacco was based in four tobacco products in the Eurobarometer. In next slide, we may see that uh, almost 80% of the consumption of tobacco is in terms of uh, traditional or manufactured factory made uh, cigarettes. But as we can see in the next slide, whoops, the, uh, the appearance is more than 100%. This is the proportion about all smokers who use manufacture plus roll your own plus other forms of tobacco or nicotine products. So you may see that the, the, the blue square now goes beyond 100% because several of the smokers are using more than one product at the same time. The most two used uh, products and combined are manufactured and roll your own cigarettes, but also in combination with cigars, cigarillos, pipes, very traditional in this case, but also with new products like electronic cigarettes and heated tobacco products. This, as we can see here in, in next slide, means that uh, we are uh, tackling poly tobacco use. Poly tobacco use is important and I believe, or, well, my idea is that this has also to, to be one of the things to be considered in the new TPD because uh, pro other products uh, different from manufactured traditional cigarettes are used to minimize the cost of smoking as uh, as Thea has remembered us, taxation is the most uh, important action to uh, control tobacco for tobacco prevention. And also to, um, to stimulate cessation among smokers. And also these products are used to circumvent smoking bans in public places. Um, the use of electronic cigarettes is not regulated in all the countries, uh, the same with water pipes, etc. In next slide, uh, I wanted to show a few data from the Joint Action of Tobacco Control based on the uh, European Union Common Entry Gate, the EUSIC database uh, already mentioned, just to see the diversity of tobacco products that are notified uh, to the member states. In this case, is uh, the period between June uh, 2016 and October. Uh, 2019, as you may see in this slide, in next slide, okay, the most frequent cigarettes are the cigarettes and cigars followed by other tobacco products like water pipes, you may see that it's important in almost all the countries, as well as novel tobacco products. So the diversity of products is complicating the legislation and this has to be taken into account. In next slide, <clears throat> Uh, we can see um, data from the US plus Spain that consists in a cohort of uh, uh, representative samples of smokers in six European countries. In this case, we have also added the, the data from two other countries, UK and the Netherlands. And we can see how in the period of two years, uh, smokers, these are only smokers, change or don't change uh, the type of tobacco product used. Most of the smokers uh, remain, uh, most of the smokers, as you can see in the left of the slide, 70% uh, use uh, factory made uh, cigarettes and most of them continue to, continue to uh, use factory made cigarettes. But you may also see the trajectories uh, from smokers using roll your own tobacco uh, several, most of them also continue with this product and uh, the uh, trajectories of those who smoke uh, electronic cigarettes or the dual use of factory made and roll your own. As we may see on the left, about 12% of smokers in two years have quit it, but there are some transitions between factory made and other categories like uh, roll your own or uh, electronic cigarettes. In the next slide, uh, I very quickly, we talk about the prevalence of electronic cigarettes use in, in Europe. That is ranging between uh, 0.6% in Spain to 7% in England. This data come from uh, representative samples of the population in each of these 12 countries. 
sample populations about uh, 1,000 people uh, aged 18 years or, or plus. So uh, this is one of the novel, one of the some uh, the, the the methods to, to consume nicotine more novel that uh, has a, a wide variation in in Europe. In the next slide, we may see uh, not the prevalence of cigarette use, but the prevalence of exposure to the aerosols exhaled by the electronic cigarette users. As we may see here, the variation is huge too. Uh, with an average exposure of 16% across these 12 countries. These 12 countries represent about 80% of the total population of, of Europe, ranging in this case between 4% in Spain and 30% in England. What does this mean? As we can see in the in next slide, please. Uh, well, there are also variations and we can also um, highlight that uh, regular use is higher in young people or in younger population, in this case, below 44 years old, and also with uh, some differences uh, by gender and with a clear uh, trend by level of education. In next slide, uh, we may see uh, on the left that on average, each electronic cigarette user is exposing is exposing daily more than six non-users to the aerosols of uh, electronic cigarettes. Even though the low prevalence of use, this is more important than the similar ratio between smokers and people uh, passively exposed. That is only one smoker, one non-smoker exposed to uh, the secondhand smoke. In next slide, also, using data from the, the tax study, we can see the prevalence of heated tobacco products that is still low in uh, these 12 European countries, about 2%, ranging uh, similar to electronic cigarettes between 0.6 in Spain and 8.3 in Greece, in this case. So uh, heated tobacco products are of concern. Uh, its use is increasing. And in many cases, its use is linked uh, to circumvent part of the legislation, not only smoke-free legislation, but also advertising, packaging, et cetera. In next slide, we may see how there is also a clear uh, age and educational gradient. And more importantly, perhaps, is that uh, heated tobacco products are used by 4% of current smokers, 2% of former smokers, this is don't smoke, didn't smoke, and now they use heated tobacco products, are using uh, these products, and also uh, a very low but significant proportion of people uh, who had never smoked. Okay, in next slide, we may see a part of the perceptions of the smokers. In this case, we are referring to the US Plus study, which has samples of smokers. So uh, why they are using these products? Because they believe that are much less harmful than traditional smoking in 30% of, of cases, but uh, almost 50% believe that uh, they are equally harmful. In the next slide, please we may see which are the associated factors. Again, age, the younger, the, uh, the more important use, and also this uh, inverse trend with uh, occasional smokers and direct uh, relationship with ever use of electronic cigarettes. HTP, heated product of products, are not electronic cigarettes, but they are linked to uh, their use too. Okay, in next slide, we may see the prevalence, the distribution of uh, cigarette flavors, different types of tobacco according to the uh, cigarette flavors. So we may see uh, in the first column, menthol, I will concentrate in this, with a huge difference between males and females. Also an important inverse trend with age 
and uh, the same uh, gradient or trend with education, the highest, the level of education, the highest use of menthol uh, products. This data comes from 2018. In next slide, we may see how also um, the use of menthol has changed after the TPD. However, this data, the follow-up is still 2018 and uh, most all the countries uh, use the extension of the European Commission for the application of the menthol ban. So we are very convinced that these uh, figures have changed, but uh, given that we, we were not able to continue the follow-up of the cohorts beyond 2018, we don't have this data. But we can see that uh, half of menthol users remained using menthol products, while uh, about 36% uh, change, uh, no, sorry, 23% uh, shifted to unflavored products and a small proportion, 15%, uh, quit it. Uh, those using unflavored uh, products uh, mostly maintain, uh, a few of them also, almost 12% quit it completely, but uh, unflavored uh, tobacco products were more prevalent uh, two years later, later among this cohort of smokers from six European countries. In next slide. Esteve, if I can, uh, if I can remind you that we're just about over time. Okay, so um, this was just to show the importance of mentors. This data comes from the USIC database in which in this period of time, these are absolute uh, numbers, um, regarding the priority additives, one of the uh, priority additives that were notified to the, to the through the database was menthol products. And in next slide, we have, we can skip because we, I was going to uh, talk about the awareness and the support. Next slide, please. That is very important, the smoker support, not the general population, but in this case, uh, for example, we can see here in the graph on the left that about 40% of smokers in almost all countries support uh, plain packaging. 30% uh, uh, also uh, would restrict purchase locations and uh, about 30%, 25, 30% uh, will support also a ban on slim cigarettes. In next slide, I believe we are with all the uh, slides. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for using more time. <laughs> then... Thank you. You did present quite a lot of uh, interesting data. And if you have a look at the q and it, uh, it raised a lot of interest from, uh, from our audience. So uh -huh. thank you very much for that, uh, Esteve. Um, we thank you to, to all the speakers today uh, for, for your interventions. I am, um, I am uh, now pleased that we can move to the next part of today's uh, event, which is um, a panel discussion between um, three intervenants. Um, uh, it is uh, first, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Vinaya Prasad, uh, who comes uh, from us from the WHO, uh, from the uh, um, sorry, the Tobacco Free um, Initiative. I'm going to anyway. Um, Ms. Alessandra Moretti, MEP, uh, who is a um, a co-chair of the MEP uh, Lung Health Group and uh, um, Rotger Handigman from the Dutch Smoke Free Alliance. Um, I am going to ask you uh, to activate your cameras now. And um, I will start with, um, I think, yeah, we're going to, to have you in spotlight for, for the first um, few, uh, for, for this uh, part of the discussion. And then we will open up the, uh, the discussion with the Q&As uh, selected from the audience. There's a lot of uh, activity um, for, uh, for the speakers as well, um, as in Atea and, um, 
and uh, Esteve because Linda couldn't stay with us, uh, unfortunately. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for accepting to join us today. Um, your time is precious and we very much appreciate your presence. I am going to uh, ask a, a first a, a sort of general question to uh, Dr. Prasad. Um, you work in global tobacco control, and um, I was wondering if you could give us a, a commentary on why EU regulation is, uh, is, is it important globally, does it have an influence, uh, and why that is. Thank you, Anka, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, colleagues. Um, uh, for this opportunity, uh, it's important for WHO colleagues from both WHO Euro and WHO headquarters to be able to uh, speak to this August uh, group. Uh, but let me first begin by congratulating the commission uh, for the progress that you have made, um, the reduction in 2% use, which is impressive. Of course, still missing the targets. Also, uh, that the directive is uh, fully uh, transposed um, with, as, uh, with the uh, WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Uh, so much of the provisions are fully aligned. And then it becomes a very important reference point uh, for us, as well as for other countries to work on. And truly impressive to see um, the progress on uh, health warning labels and move uh, by almost, I think, nine countries into plain packaging or standardized packaging. Uh, we are definitely also looking very closely at the tra uh, traceability uh, system, the track and trace, because a number of countries, especially in Africa, are looking at lessons from uh, this region. And, and on the uh, novel emerging products, uh, so the progress made by the, um, uh, through the UTPD, especially in terms of creating databases uh, and looking at a more comprehensive uh, strategy uh, is quite impressive. Uh, so in that sense, these are really uh, some things which uh, we believe uh, are important uh, from uh, a global perspective. Uh, I do see uh, that the next round of TPD, how um, it becomes uh, an, an L instrument, uh, which could be emulated by other regions uh, and how you could prevent the manufacturers from seeking regulatory carve out. Those lessons become extremely important. Uh, in WHO to, to be able to see uh, its re replication in, um, in other parts of the world. I think we've also the discussion on uh, characterizing flavors and the menthol ban experience, which I think uh, many of you are aware, we are organizing a webinar later uh, today uh, to learn uh, more and see how, where are the challenges because these are good examples which you, we could look at. You could also look at challenges uh, which the, the region is facing. And because there are a lot of um, interests, there are a number of countries which are currently looking at um, uh, in putting similar provisions uh, as well. So yeah, so thank you very much um, and uh, happy to be part of this panel discussion. Many, many thanks, uh, Vinayak. You raised uh, a few really important points about, uh, about the importance of EU regulation. And I think in a sense that puts a little bit more uh, responsibility on getting it right um, the next time around, just like the last time around. Um, I'm going to move to, to Ms. Moretti. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, my um, first question to you is, um, how do you see the role of the European Parliament in ensuring um, a good, uh, timely, a robust revision of the, of the Tobacco Products Directive, you know, considering the, the European Cancer Plan? Thank you. Thank you for this invitation. I'm very happy to stay with you. And uh, from uh, an historic point of view, the European Parliament has uh, always been uh, the voice of uh, the citizens. 
Over time, in the past uh, decades, uh, the EP has uh, demonstrated to be the key player in the development uh, of new policies aimed at improving the protection of uh, human and public health, uh, the environment, and citizens' and consumers' rights. We have done a good job with the current uh, legislation on tobacco because we have managed to include concrete and improved elements of protection of our citizens. Of course, there is a broad margin of improvement and uh, I welcome events like uh, this because they are unique opportunities to learn about the latest developments uh, in science and to discuss together with you, the doctors, the experts, the appropriate policies to tackle this issue and promote a tobacco-free Europe in the next future. I believe a revision of the regulation is urgent. The latest legislation is now quite outdated. We have new devices to be regulated and new findings from the science community which could be helpful into the fight against cancer. Also, now we have the beating cancer plan. We have a unique opportunity to have a, a tremendous impact on the, the next few generations. We can and we should use all the opportunities, including updating a legislation that to me is now outdated. In this sense, I think the European Parliament can play a key role to push the Commission to speed up the process and to present a proposal as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I guess we will uh, we will uh, take that question in a few minutes back to uh, back to Thea, who can tell us what the next steps will be and and what kind of timelines we should envisage. Um, thank you very much for your uh, for your intervention. Um, we've talked a lot about um, about novel products. I would like to ask um, perhaps uh, both uh, both uh, Dr. Prasad and and yourself, Ms. Moretti, about um, uh, the uh, tobacco industry's uh, pushing of its uh, novel products. Um, with a particular focus, and it's it's a sort of well-known documented tactics of uh, of targeting either particularly young people or vulnerable people or groups such as uh, such as young women. We've heard from Linda McAvan that that was a concern before, um, and it appears to to remain. Um, uh, concern. So I think a first question I would uh, I would direct to to Dr. Prasad is, do you see any unmet needs in addressing vulnerable groups in in the European region or in the EU? Um, thank you. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. the hard facts are that we still have 1.3 billion users in the world, uh, tobacco users, uh, all, all, all tobacco products included. So that's a large number, 8 million deaths from tobacco mm -hmm. and Euro, Euro has a high, quite a high share of that. So while uh, we, we are seeing good progress and we are seeing the alignment with the FCTC commitments, uh, the, ch the challenge has been uh, that the industry is more nimble footed than the member states. And so what we are seeing now is that, um, I mean, let me give two specific examples. One, in terms of overall tobacco use for, let's take the case of women tobacco use. So all across the world is seeing a decline and nearly a hitting a 30% relative reduction which Thea mentioned uh, is, is happening. The reduction is happening in all parts of the world, but which region has not done well? compared to other regions, it's the Euro, Euro region. So that's something to pause for a minute saying, even LDC countries have made much more progress than a number of developed world economies on overall tobacco product decline amongst women. 
which is a which is a matter of concern that the industry has managed to break and penetrate the uh, the girls and the women now when i talk of the girls the which is our future and which is where the whole european region's effort are concentrated again very worrisome because we are having i think about 12% of girls in the age of 13 to 15 who are current tobacco users that's one and a half times more than the global average of 8% not for the boys but for the girls so i'm just looking at future women of europe they are already at risk much higher than the rest of the world let's come to the second issue the worrying trends of e-cigarettes and use of smokeless products so the, there are challenges uh, in terms of regulating some of these products. Synthetic nicotine, nicotine pouches, you can, you can, we can run a long list. You know, the industry will keep coming with new products. The directives must be more nimble footed, not wait for a, a five year time cycle to be able to regulate these products. Because by, by the time you do it, it's already in the market in a big way. And again, mind you, synthetic pouches and these uh, synthetic nicotines and pouches are already available in a number of other jurisdictions. So industry tactics is to scale this up aggressively. On the use of e-cigarettes, and uh, also we are seeing that in a number of countries in Europe, uh, the use is actually going up uh, in a big way. And of course, the, all partners are conscious of that but we, uh, there is no harmonization of, um, of uh, our common understanding of how to proceed. So uh, population-based approach, looking at the holistic picture is what we would recommend uh, when uh, it comes to the use of e-cigarettes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vinayak. Uh, a very comprehensive overview of where Europe stands compared to the rest of the world. I think on that uh, slightly alarming uh, note, I would pass to, to Ms. Moretti. Um, how do you see the role of EU legislation in addressing uh, these inequalities um, generated by tobacco? Yes, I think that uh, we need. Uh to be very, very clear on this. The pressure on this topic will be enormous. In fact, it has already started and is unfortunately backed by a ridiculous amount of money. The tobacco industry is one of the most powerful ones with basically unlimited resources and this tells a lot about the challenge we will be facing in the next few months. I think that in theory, we should not be afraid of listening to everyone, but at the same time, the resources to conduct lobbying activity available to the tobacco industry are much more than the ones available for organizations like yours or any medical and clinical society, for example. It's uh, therefore a problem of being very clear and strict on this. We need to ensure on the one hand, the maximum level of transparency, but at the same time, ensure that all voices are heard, especially the ones of the scientific community. For this reason, interest groups like the one of lung of Earth issues could be decisive and I'm glad that we started to discuss together this common challenge. Uh, the road uh, is very, very clear in front of us. Thanks to the scientific community, we know what works in the fight against tobacco. We know it because it works so far. Through public policies, we have managed to tackle the tobacco issue and sensibly diminish the number of smokers. Very shortly, we need to make smoking less convenient and less attractive. We need to work on both directions. 
from up to bottom with stricter regulations and limitation to smoking, but also from the bottom up through more education and information campaigns targeting particular on the youth. Today, we are starting to see some results from policies approved years ago. We see that our young people are consistently smoking less. We need to make sure to follow up on this trend and build up on that without any hesitation. Therefore, I welcome some of the proposals by the rapporteur on the draft BECA report, which was just presented last week. For example, the increase on excises and taxation, a stricter regulation on plain packaging and broader space for health warnings on cigarettes and tobacco products, the ban on flavored tobacco, restrictions on smoking in public spaces, these are all things that work in this in the past, and we need to make sure that we further develop these policies. Why? Because they have proven to be effective. If coupled with prevention policies and education campaigns. So at this point, we really need to build up a political support for a fast track on the revision of the tobacco directive. I will do my best in the BECA committee to push for this in coordination with the other political groups that I hope will be with us on this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think you raised a couple of, uh, of uh, points that prompt me to, to pass to, to Rodher now. Uh, as a representative of a national coalition uh, in the Netherlands who, um, who achieved quite a lot in the few years, um, uh, uh, how the Netherlands has adopted recently an ambition to become tobacco free and uh, the civil society, uh, the scientific society, the um, uh, uh, quite a large coalition was part of that change. Um, Ruther, do you think you could tell us a little bit about how that came about? Just a few years ago, the Netherlands wasn't really doing very well in tobacco control. And all of a sudden, it's now at the, at the forefront of efforts in, in Europe. So how did that come about? What role did civil society play? And uh, so what happened? Yes, yes, of course. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Dutch Smoke Free Alliance. Um, uh, first of all, uh, a, a quick reaction to something uh, which was said earlier about uh, uh, that new tobacco products may protect against cancer. Uh, me, as an as a, uh, uh, employee of the Dutch Heart Foundation, um, have, have, uh, have to stress uh, that it, that is not the case for uh, cardiovascular diseases. Um, there is evidence and much evidence that uh, the new tobacco products uh, is very harmful for that. So uh, that noted, um, yes, indeed, in 2013, uh, um, um, the Health Funds for a Smoke-Free Netherlands was established by the Dutch Cancer Society, the Dutch Lung Fund, and the Dutch Heart Foundation. And at that time, we were not doing well in the Netherlands uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to smoking. The Dutch society was strongly polarized on the issue of smoking, and the government at that time did not have a sol solid policy around tobacco use. In fact, some measurements that did exist were put on ice or even broken down. Um, yeah, the health minister at that time was even nicknamed uh, the minister of tobacco. So yeah, there were, there were not, there were, those were not good times and we did not compare well to other European countries. Um, and at that time, there were only a handful of groups who wanted to work towards reducing tobacco use. Uh, and of course we had the FCTC with measurements uh, and there was a large silent majority so in 2015, things um, changed drastically. Um, and that change occurred because of a strong focus on building support through a widely shared inspirational goal, um, the smoke-free generation. Um, and in our communication, in our story, we put the protection of our children at the center of it all. And this worked very well, also on a political level, because after all, nobody wants children to start smoking. 
And meanwhile, we created a rapidly growing society, a social movement of governments, organizations and companies and individuals um, who were and still are actively taking steps towards the smoke-free Netherlands. Um, and it, it, it is very much a, a grassroots approach. Uh, everyone can participate, everyone can do something. And using a step-by-step -step approach, more and more partners from all corners of society have been motivated to contribute. Um, so through a coordinated interplay between on the one hand, mass communication about the smoke-free generation to create a large support base. Um, and on the other hand, an active political lobby um, with active speakers, uh, stakeholders who speak out, uh, who spoke out and, and, and supported the smoke-free generations and some with a more forcible approach. Um, yeah, some good results have been achieved. And one of the most tangible and potentially sustainable uh, uh, results is the National Prevention Agreement, which you referred to, Anka. Uh, in 2018, in which civil society and the government have agreed on, measurement, uh, on measures and activ activities to uh, achieve a smoke-free generation by 2040. Uh, so 2040, but um, we want to reach it sooner, of course, and we are working on that, but it's a base, it's something to work from. Um, and the smoke-free generation has since established itself as a, a strong brand. It's a recognizable platform that links activities. It makes the movement towards a smoke-free generation visible at all levels of society. And the platform is used both by the health funds and by thousands of other parties who are moving towards this milk free generation. Uh, but the tipping point, uh, the tip, uh, the point at which government and society move forward quickly enough without additional outside mo uh, motivation has not been reached yet. And as health funds, we play an important role in this campaign. Um, regardless of the political context, uh, we, had, we just had elections in March and um, they're taking their time in, 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 in The Hague, in our uh, governmental uh, capital, to, 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 uh, to agree on a, a new government. Um, but regardless of the political context, uh, we, we can make a strong long-term commitment to the, to the issue. Whereas government policy depends on, well, the political complexion of the government's in power at the time. So, yes, that's basically what has happened uh, in a nutshell in the last six to seven years in the Netherlands. Thank you and congratulations. I guess uh, congratulations are uh, are in order, and I think we can uh, we can learn quite a little bit uh, from um, from that. Um, I'm uh, wondering. I'm mindful of the time, and I'm wondering if it would be possible already to um, to ask uh, Esteve and Thea to open your your cameras, and maybe we can extend the conversation a little bit. We've had. Um, uh, we had a quite a um, lively discussion in the Q&A box, if you're following it. Um, there, there have been a, a quite a lot of cross questions and answers. Um, I think a, 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 I will start with one general theme that comes, um, that comes from, uh, from that discussion and from some of our preparation. Um, which is, and I, I will, I will start by asking uh, Ms. Moretti, um, um, how do you see uh, this, uh, this need, is there a need uh, to uh, consider a stricter regulation of novel tobacco products, um, such as heated tobacco, mm -hmm. and what would be your arguments? Mm -hmm. And then I will extend that question also to, uh, to Thea, if she's available uh, to um, uh, turn on your camera. Um, and then if Thea can also comment about what the thinking is uh, in the commission at the moment. So Ms. Moretti, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On this, uh, we need to be very, very clear. Uh, we, uh, as politicians, uh, really on the scientific uh, community, we know that these products uh, are promoted uh, as less harmful, but we also know that they are still harmful. We don't know the consequences uh, in the long term the possible implication in many directions, not just for lung and respiratory disease, but also cardiovascular ones. And, and it seems by the latest research, possibly also for bladder cancer and other types of cancers. We need to start from one thing. These new products have to be regulated. 
because when we approved the last EU legislation on tobacco, they didn't exist. Therefore, yes, we need to regulate them and I hope that we will be able to do it soon. Our approach will be as many other similar situations to use the principle of precaution as the guiding one, protecting the youth and our kids to avoid that these new products become a gateway to an addiction for our kids. We will need to discuss this with you very, very deeply to understand all the ramifications and the possible impact on public health of these novel products. The policies that we will promote will come from you. They will come from the scientific community. To contribute into the regulation of these products, new products, therefore, I look very much forward to be in close contact with all of you and to work together for the best possible outcome in the interest of our citizens and public health. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. If I could uh, pass the question now on to, uh, to Thea Emmerling, what is the current thinking about novel tobacco products? And uh, while I have uh, you on the microphone, uh, perhaps you could give us an idea of what's next in this revision process and, and what kind of timing we should uh, have in mind. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to put on my camera, but it tells me that, that the host um, um, has restricted me. It says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. So um, I can't start it. Um. <laughs> I'm sure colleagues are now trying to, to fix it for you. Okay, yeah. There you are. You are back, but you have something in front of you. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Well, um, on, uh, on the novel products, I mean, I, I have outlined uh, in my presentation our current thinking. Um, so the paragraph on the novel tobacco products has some shortcomings that we have seen that we need to address. And we also uh, need to address some of the shortcomings in the e-cigarette parts. Let's not forget that we were the first jurisdiction at the regional level that regulated electronic cigarettes. Um, so, um, I mean, at the time that was, it, it, it was a tremendous step forward that they are regulated. And uh, now, some years later, we see the world has moved on, uh, market developments have happened, and we need much more flexibility than um, what we have so far. So um, my line on, on uh, all these novel and nicotine products is uh, we need to look at what exactly we want to cover, um, especially also lo looking at other nicotine products. And we need to look at what we want to strengthen. And by the way, don't forget advertising. It is not all just uh, product regulation. Um, we see a lot of uh, violations here. Um, they are also the novel products. Um, and here I would really like to echo um, what we have uh, heard from the parliament. They are not harmless products. They are nicotine is a toxic and addictive substance. And um, so, uh, if, we also, in the EU, we don't have in the legislation a harm reduction policy that is not in the legislation. And um, I can also answer to some of the questions that I've seen um, why we haven't you looked at uh, harm reduction potential of novel products, and I can answer them. Look at Article 28. Um, that gives us the mandate and what we were supposed to look at. And we were supposed to look at market developments for e-cigarettes and refill container. We were uh, supposed to look at initiation um, and uh, of the impact of such products on cessation efforts, as well as on flavors. That was the mandate given to us. And that was the mandate uh, we also looked at uh, scientifically. Um, that is, uh, and, and um, we, so 
so far, so uh, the opinion that we got from um, the scientific committee is uh, supporting the precautionary approach that we have taken so far. And um, it also supports, uh, it is supporting um, the public health approach uh, to these products that we have taken so far, because one cannot just look at the individual, but uh, we are here to have a public health approach and to uh, bring down the harm for the society as a whole. So um, it, 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 it would be jumping too short to just look um, at one product and compare it to the other. Um, now on, you asked me for the timeline. Well, this is a, a timeline for revision. This is a five-year application report. It's the first report we are bringing. It's the first experience um, we, we are publishing, what, what we have. Um, there are still implementation steps of the present directive that we have to pursue. Let's not forget 2024 is the last step to extend the track and trace system to all tobacco products uh, from, from, um, from uh, cigarettes and roll your own where we have it so far. So we haven't even yet completely implemented the present directive. I give this um, for your consideration. Um, I, but I hear the plea um, to be ambitious and to really use the political uh, impetus that we get from the uh, Cancer Action Plan. And let's not forget the first TPD in Europe was uh, the lasting child of the first cancer plan that we had at European level. So, um, and, and the second cancer plan, this one now, um, has also a strong component on, uh, on, on tobacco. But I mean, it's not, it's a whole basket of measures, tobacco control is not just the TPD. So we will um, carefully prepare the proposal um, this application report is a first step. Uh, we are having discussions. We are in the council with discussions. We are happy to come to the parliament um, if, uh, to, to discuss the application report, to gather the views. We are also reaching out um, to, to the society and to NGOs. And my participation is, uh, in, in this event is also that um, I hear voices and we hear voices, what people think of, um, of what we have proposed. Um, and the next step, it's clearly, it's the start of the evaluation and the impact assessment. This is uh, how uh, every piece of legislation starts in the EU, and we have to go through this process. Um, you have, Several of you have stressed um, all the lobbying that took place at the last revision of the TPD, so we must be well prepared, we must have good data, a good database, we must have good uh, grounds, and um, we are currently working on it. And I can tell you the next step um, is the evaluation and um, the impact assessment. And then we come with a proposal, but I cannot yet give you a date, but I, I am I will be happy to use uh, for the proposal to use the political drive um, that is uh, being given by the Cancer Action Plan. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Thea. Um, I think Esteve wanted to to add something, um, and in giving you the floor, there were a few slides that you went over quite fast at the very end about political support. And I think that also translates into the mandate given to, to elected uh, politicians, to MEPs, if the, people, um, if the people of Europe support tobacco control. So Esteve, if you can add to, to what you wanted to add and then maybe comment a little bit on public support. Yeah, well, I, I'll start with, uh linking with Thea's answer, because I wanted to highlight another aspect of HCPs, uh, heated tobacco products and electronic cigarettes that uh, I believe it's important. Uh, they are not very, they are not well regulated or there are some loopholes and dark uh, areas in the regulation of these, uh, of these products uh, in, for, the, for advertisement. I know that it's not uh, uh, a domain of the TPD because uh, there are there is another tobacco directive 
from the European Commission, from the European Union, the Tobacco Advertisement Directive that has been not revised in the last 10 or 12 years. But I believe that these products, both electronic cigarettes and heated tobacco products that are tobacco, have played with uh, these gray zones uh, regarding advertising. For example, and linking to menthol uh, flavor before, before the well, the entrance in, in force of the final ban uh, the 20th of May uh, in 2020. Uh, different brands of electronic cigarettes, uh, different companies uh, promoting uh, heated tobacco products, uh, promoted uh, these products as a way to circumvent the menthol ban in cigarettes. So this, is, this was very clear in several uh, EU countries. Moreover, uh, well, for example, for heated tobacco products, we have the stick with the tobacco because it is tobacco treated in a different form as in a pipe or in a uh, conventional cigarette or uh, roll your own tobacco. It is tobacco, but they promote, they advertise the device. This is as, well, imagine that we have a ban on alcohol drinks and uh, the company says, no, I'm not advertising uh, this, uh, this product, but the bottle. So it's uh, really uh, uh, something that we have to take into account both in the revision of the TPD and hopefully in the, in the pathway to a uh, revised uh, tobacco, um, uh, to a tobacco advertising directive too. And uh, regarding the smoker support, for tobacco control, well, yes, I, I was out of time. <laughs> Thank you, Anka. Because I believe it's uh, nice information because it is it comes from uh, samples of smokers in different countries with different legislation. And I was not able to mention this. Uh, for example, the ban in, in uh, uh, the support for plain packaging, for example, it's very high, it's very high in Spain, in Poland, in Romania, about 40% of smokers. In the general population, in non-smokers is even higher, between 70 and 80 or 85%, coming from data from the tax study that I haven't been able to, to show. But I believe this is important. And uh, the correlation of this support with um, the current legislation in each of the countries. For example, in Germany, uh, the support for plain packaging is very, very low, uh, very low. Half of that in Spain, 20% uh, approximately. And Germany is one of the countries, according, well, we know from different sources, but I have to mention the tobacco control scale, uh, is one of the countries in the queue of uh, uh, implementation of uh, tobacco control measures, any of the potential tobacco control measures from uh, helping smokers to quit to taxation, okay? So I believe that this is important. And this means that in the countries where more <clears throat> uh, policies for tobacco control are implemented, the population, even smokers, are shifting and are reacting and are, are inclined to accept uh, plain packaging and also the cases of uh, countries in Europe, Ireland, UK, and France, and uh, as far as I remember, and I don't know which is the other country, uh, that have implemented uh, plain packaging together with taxation, the results are very good because uh, the prevalence of smokers and the prevention of smoking in young people uh, well, uh, shows uh, very good figures. Thank you. Um, thank you very much um, for, for your commentary, Esteve. I, I saw a lot of nods going as you were, as you were talking mm -hmm. um, from, from the other, the other panelists. Um, uh, well, this is this is getting very interesting. We uh, interesting. We had a question in the, in the in the Q and A. We had a question on the regulation of uh, of flavors and whether there is scope for 
uh, banning all, all characterizing flavors in all tobacco products. I think this has been partially covered uh, in your answers. I'm just wondering if there's anything that uh, that could be added at this point. But it seems uh, it seems to be a, a general direction of travel from what I could read in the in the report and I could hear from uh, from Thea's presentation. Um, I'm wondering, Thea, would you would you be able to confirm that that is something that can be um, considered? Um, yeah, clear. Um, you have seen that in yeah. the Cancer Action Plan, um, a full ban of flavors is mentioned. Um, in our application report, we also say that uh, it needs to be looked at. Um, so this is an avenue that will be explored, but I can't go over the outcome of the evaluation and an impact assessment uh, at this point in time. But I mean, it's very clear that will be explored. We also see um, that member states are acting on this one where they can act. Um, and uh, for example, on, on e-cigarettes, um, I've said in my presentation that uh, several that's free for member states to act. Several member states uh, are using this possibility. And um, yeah, so um, that is that uh, that's going towards it. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm not muted. Um, I wanted to also uh, maybe prompt uh, Vinayak back on and um, ask him about how do you see, um, if, you, if you could comment a little bit on the gaps that we've identified in the implementation of tobacco control measures in Europe and um, where, where are some of the concerns that you would see as needing to be identified at the regional level? Um, and then, uh, and then I think I will have one final question to all the panelists before we finish. Thank you, uh, Anka. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Thea has covered a number of very valid points and also coming from the application report, uh, need for a, a very comprehensive set of definitions so that the legislation is more comprehensive and futuristic. I think that's an important element. Uh, the other element which I flagged earlier was on looking at some of the gendered approaches because uh, clearly the industry is able to penetrate through uh, and reach out to the girls and uh, women much better than our programs. So the focus on tobacco control needs to stay and because Europe is still uh, ha having a high burden because sometimes I'm worried that the discussion on novel products sometimes derails the discussion on tobacco and which is where the industry is making its profit. But also it's important, and again, I don't understand much, but uh, how you create synergies with all of your directives, whether the tax directive, they're looking at uh, how you strengthen enforcement, how you target the current smokers with stronger cessation efforts, and how you look at, for example, the polluter pay principle, the, the single use plastic, ban which has come from an environmental aspect but it really starts to hit the industry and to make it more uh, holistic in terms of our control on what gets to be sold and where i think that to me is an important area of work um, which i see some more work need, is needed in the ne next round of the directive and uh, really looking forward to it because it help, helps build our case for Scale up, scale up in similar manner using the directive for other parts of the world. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. I'm wondering if there's a if there's a comment to to Vinak's question. If not, I do have a very very burning question for all the panelists. Okay, well, my, my burning question is, I think, first of all, I think we've just raised uh, sufficient uh, topics for another, I don't know, four or five policy dialogues moving forward. Uh, I think even, um, even uh, 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 once you raise the issue of tax, you know, don't even get me started on that. Uh, and tax is coming in the EU as well. We're expecting a revision of the EU tax directive. Um, no, I think my question is uh, because I'm a civil society person and I can't help it. Um, 
Uh, I think it's a multi-pronged uh, issue. Um, what, so first of all, what uh, do we learn about uh, the role of civil, civil society from uh, those countries that have really involved civil society and uh, in their tobacco free ambitions? Uh, and, and that would be a, a question to Rodhar. The second question, because we heard about the importance of scientific evidence and the importance of independent scientific evidence, um, how do we um, how do we uh, ensure that uh, that evidence reaches policymakers, and how do we do with that? And where do you see uh, civil society organizations, public health organizations at European and at national level, in uh, in pushing uh, further the uh, the tobacco products directive and in general tobacco control regulation? So um, if I could ask. Uh, perhaps Rutger for uh, you know half a minute if you can uh, tell us what you've learned from uh, from that and then I would uh, ask perhaps um, all the speakers to make a very short comment on, uh, on 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 you know the role of collaboration and the role of independence and the role of civil society But I would start with Rose Hart. Oh, please tell me you're not muted. Okay, thank you. Um, well, what we learned um, is um, basically um, uh, to, to unite with uh, different different uh, uh, organizations, different individuals from all uh, kinds of society and establish a clear and long-term strategy based on scientific evidence, but also on market data to measure support. That's some basic support amongst uh, the people of the Netherlands, basically. And, and use that to, put, to, 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 to increase political pressure. So have a long-term strategy with a roadmap and a time frame. Um, establish an inspirational goal, which you use in communication. And, you, and then in that package towards politicians and policymakers, you can, 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 can add taxation and uh, 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 flavors and, and all, all those kinds of things, which are more difficult to communicate to the general public. Uh, um, so yeah, I think that is the balance, that whole package uh, so, uh, that, um, uh, that, I, that has helped in the Netherlands. And of course, you're also always dependent on political will and political leadership. So we, we got a little bit lucky with our current health minister who really made an effort to, uh, um, to, to, to take uh, 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 measurements in the Netherlands. Um. Thank you. Can I uh, ask uh, Thea if she has a comment on this the topic? Yeah, um, thank you, Anka. I mean, when, when we prepare a legislative proposal, um, you are aware uh, that um, we will have to hear all stakeholders, um, NGOs, um, uh, health experts, industry, everybody. And um, so the role of NGOs here is um, we need strong, a strong health voice. And um, so um, that's a very important um, role that uh, you will play when we come to the consultation, to the official uh, consultation stages. And um, you, when it goes through the parliament and the council, there, the same a strong health voice is of utmost importance um, because um, the industry will make its voice heard. Um, that is clear. Um, for the, the health is much more diverse, and uh, there is also a risk that it's a bit diluted. Um, so, strong health voice um, is key. Um, another very important role is uh, watch the space, watch transparency. Um, you've seen that um, we have in our cancer action plan made a specific commitment to transparency. Um, we have a mandatory transparency register at the commission. There is also an interinstitutional agreement, uh, parliament, council and commission to have a transparency re register um, also with the other institutions. To my knowledge, it's not uh, yet, um, it, it's been negotiated, um, but I don't know where it stands um, as regards signature, but uh, we will have hopefully a different um, space in negotiation that we had last time, because there is 
um, this uh, this uh, commitment to transparency and you also have a very important role to play to watch what is happening. Thank you. Um, Esteve has his hand up and I will direct a, a, a variant of this question to you about the role of evidence. And we've had some comments in the Q&A on that. So Esteve, you're on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> You have to unmute yourself, however. <laughs> Forever. Okay, thank you very much, Anka. I wanted to comment on, on this independent scientific evidence that we need, all of us need, administration need evidence, uh, social, civil society needs evidence, stakeholders need uh, evidence. The problem is that independent scientific evidence needs funding. This is the main question. And uh, for example, uh, most of the results I have uh, shown come from two studies, the TAX project and the, and the URES Plus study that were funded and that under research contracts and funded by the European Commission. Uh, we were working for about four years, one year before to prepare the application in a competitive call that was more or less targeted to respiratory diseases and tobacco control, secondhand smoke, et cetera, uh, electronic cigarettes, um, well, and burden of disease. But that call was the last one in the, in the last uh, six years that has appeared in this topic. So we have provided a lot of information, spending a lot of money, and I believe with great responsibility, each uh, project was funded by about 3 million euros and uh, working, putting into work more than 20, 25 different research teams across more than uh, 12 countries in, in Europe and also uh, colleagues from uh, Canada. So evidence need good research and good research cannot be done without funding. So I believe that this is also very important because to provide this type of evidence, we are asking for competitive calls. This is clear. This, they have to be evaluated. To, they need an evaluation. But the problem is that, uh, well, the research program in the EU considers a lot of topics. And even though tobacco, uh, I believe, is landmark in this sense, and it is cross-sectional, not only to cancer, but also to cardiovascular diseases, other respiratory diseases, uh, there is a lack of funding to uh, try to do good research in the topic. Thank you. Uh, we've reached the two hour mark. Uh, I think I'm, I'm expected to close the meeting right now. I see that our uh, audience has not yet started leaving to an alarming <laughs> rate. Uh, this has been really fascinating. So um, because I have not yet been uh, ordered to stop the meeting, I can let you go on for one more sentence, uh, Esteve, but then we really need to take uh, the final comments and close the meeting. No, no, I, uh, it's okay. Nothing, nothing more. <laughs> no, I mean, clearly, clearly we have, uh, we have sufficient ideas and material to, to organize many, many such policy dialogues. And I think this is one of the takeaways for, uh, for us here that maybe we, we, we can find other opportunities to, to talk together. I am just uh, wondering if um, uh, any final comments from our panelists or speakers today uh, and if not, I will, uh, I will close the meeting now. No, it's quiet. Well, then, um, you know, I've let, uh, I've let uh, you all uh, do the sort of closing. Um, I'm, I'm supposed to do uh, some key takeaways for the event. First of all, there's clearly a lot of interest in, um, in the revision of the future revision of the Tobacco Products Directive. Um, secondly, uh, there is clearly a need to separate the forest from the trees and to look at the overall public health uh, objective and the, you know, the vision for a tobacco-free Europe by 2040. Tobacco-free means no tobacco. And, um, and uh, that is uh, perhaps the continuing aspirational uh, vision that, uh, that should be kept in mind as the, the overall framework of the EU tobacco control is being reviewed. 
um, we are going to um, to uh, provide a summary and some key recommendations following this uh, this event, this policy dialogue, uh, which will be ready in the next couple of weeks from uh, from the team of ACL and SFP and uh, the organizations who are supporting the uh, the MEP Lung Group, the MEP Heart Group, ERS, uh, European Heart Network, European Society of Cardiology. So uh, we are going to sit down uh, together and put together some uh, summaries and recommendations and they will be ready um, in the next few weeks. Uh, the slides, the recording and the recommendations uh, will be uh, sent to the participants registered and will be available online uh, sometime around mid-July. I would like to thank uh, our speakers, our panelists, uh, our uh, special address, um, Mr. Fulas, uh, at the very beginning. Um, I would like to thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today and uh, for sharing your knowledge and your views on, um, on the tobacco products directive. There's clearly a lot of work to be done. And um, with that, I declare this meeting closed. And